Namaste, Stellan. Thank you and welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Thank you for making the time. Uh, so, Stellan, what would be the earliest recollection that you have, maybe even from childhood, of either the concept or the experience of Ahimsa? So, I'm brought up in a family that um, was deeply inspired by Gandhi. So uh, my father told me about Gandhi already when I was a small little toddler. I don't remember the, um, the year, but uh, my father was telling me a lot about um, refusing to go to the military, um, of the uh, fasting that Gandhi was doing, and um, and about the principles of nonviolence, he was even uh, teaching about that when he, as a teacher at the university, brought up war and peace and uh, and um, these kind of issues. So I would say, and we were vegetarians. Um, so um, I would say that uh, this kind of formed my early life. Where were you born, Stellan? In the southern part of uh, Sweden, Scandinavia. Okay, okay. You grew up to become a scholar of resistance studies. Uh, now, to many people, that is not a very familiar concept that, uh, you know, academia now has a whole discipline called resistance studies. Uh, and it, I know that it has a special focus on civil disobedience and civil uh, uh, resistance, nonviolent resistance. So, could you briefly describe what is the nature of resistance studies and how has it taken shape? Because it is a new discipline, if I am right. Well, yes, uh, it's it's new in the meaning of uh, uh, that people are uh, in a self-referenting way talking about themselves as belonging to a field of resistance studies but um, otherwise the uh, the activity of trying to understand unarmed resistance in different forms uh, goes very long back uh, within academia so i would say that um, there are several strands here so we have obviously the the strand of people being um, inspired by various forms of pacifism and of course of Gandhi of nonviolent resistance and and of Martin Luther King. Uh, so that's the field of civil resistance. That's the area of nonviolent direct action that people are looking at the civil rights movement, the anti-colonial movement in India, and 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 various ongoing movements today. All right. But then we also have a strand that is interesting uh, in the way that it looks on what's called everyday resistance. So that's the form of, um, you could say, dispersed, individualized resistance that um, ordinary people do in, in, at their workplace um, or in the family or neighborhood without being organized in any kind of uh, formal political organization, but they are reacting to and undermining uh, forms of domination that they encounter, which can be in very different contexts, like as being uh, small farmers or um, uh, being exploited in, uh, in uh, low paid industries, or people that are living as prisoners or slaves or, or um, uh, serfs in, in the earlier times. So everyday resistance is a kind of an interesting um, uh, field, which is um, uh, also part of resistance studies. And then um, there are also people that are looking at other forms of resistance that is more uh, cultural uh, and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very broad interdisciplinary field. Um, and I would say that the kind of uh, form of uh, resistance studies that I'm interested in is primarily one that is building on the combination and dialogues between experienced activists 
and academics that work together to build a knowledge that is useful for uh, working for um, uh, liberation from domination in different okay. forms. Yeah. You're also holding the chair on the study of nonviolent direct action and civil resistance at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So uh, that's a very notable thing for there to be an entire endowed chair for this topic. Does that mean that this subject and this whole area of study is now very mainstream at major universities? And is that only in America or is it a increasingly a global phenomenon? So I would say um, it's an indication of um, uh, recognition um, that we can see. Uh, we also find that um, uh, more conventional disciplines like political science and so on has um, paid more interest to these kind of um, research. But I would say, no, it's not, uh, it's not become mainstream yet. Um, and uh, if you ask me, I would say, I hope it won't ever become mainstream. Um, I, I think there is a danger when it becomes too much institutionalized in, into the universities where I broadly, broadly regard um, academic um, universities as being very colonial um, and uh, very much integrated into the, the state that is, uh, is an organization of the monopoly of violence. So um, I think there is a space here and it's very interesting and it's, and it's growing um, and that's important, um, but it's not yet mainstream and, and, and that's probably very good. Um, mm -hmm. So we are trying to create networks. We have uh, panels and seminars. Uh, we write books and have research projects and we try to stimulate uh, particularly links and collaboration with people um, in the global south that have more trouble in finding um, funding and, and, and space to do this kind of, of, of research. Because when it is at its best, it's, it's uh, disturbing um, uh, dominant power. Um, and then um, it won't be particularly popular. I have had some trouble even in, in my position as endowed chair, um, because I bring up, for example, uh, the Palestinian um, struggles for their right and against the Israeli occupation. And that, as you know, is, is very controversial in the United States. Um, um, but otherwise, I focused quite much on, on bringing together uh, uh, experienced activists from um, the Black liberation struggle and from Native, Native American struggles. And, and right now I work on, on a global project, which is bringing together people that live under military occupation uh, to learn from each other. Wow. Um, in this context, uh, would you like to comment on the seemingly different strands that have emerged in the uh, nonviolence movements that there's the Gandhi Luther strand, which is more uh, drawing on spiritual and or religious or religious um, belief and faith and practice. Uh, and there is the Gene Sharp strand, which is uh, much more focused on the tactics and the strategy. Now, some speakers in this series have suggested that they are not separate strands and others have said that they are distinct. So what is your view on that? And I, or is it like a, 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 something that we gain from both strands? So um, uh, I think it's very correct description. Um, fortunately uh, though, uh, there are people that are, are bridging or creating a third uh, strand or, or a different approach, which I think is much more promising than, than actually any one of the, the two you mentioned. Um, so I, I think uh, the reason why we do have these two uh, orientations that I think is a valid description is probably because there are, um, um, 
in my view, uh, people that don't really understand um, the value of that uh, Gandhi did have um, a three uh, uh, prone uh, strategy. Uh, it has three different elements. And um, I would say that uh, one of them is personal transformation um, <clears throat> where the spiritual and um, the, the individual growth and change and dealing with how violence is an integrated part in us as human beings and how you try to liberate yourself as an individual is a very legitimate, very uh, Gandhian approach. However, I think Gandhi in a unique way combined that individual uh, religious tra tradition together with the political resistance uh, against dominant systems as col colonization, which has been the more uh, globally spread form, particularly with the work of Dean Sharp that kind of dismissed all the, the, the part that were spiritual or, or were about morals and, and cultural communication and only focused on the strategy part. But I think when he did that, he lost a lot of the dynamic that exists in the Gandhian approach because it's not just the individual spiritual part and the, the strategic political part, but there's also a, a third element here. And, and that's the constructive program that, that Gandhi had so much um, problems to get his uh, fellow Congress um, uh, activists to understand the importance of. And he was very, very disappointed on, on how little that was picked up. And people were only looking at the mass civil disobedience and saw that as the, the kind of key part here. But the thing is, if you combine the construction of building up alternatives together with the personal transformation of, of individuals to create new um, ways of relating and being together, also with the political resistance campaigns, uh, you have a particular dynamic that I think characterizes the Gandhian approach. And I think a lot of the problems we see today with uh, the protest movements that are actually very powerful applying the Gene Sharp model, overthrowing governments, uh, but without creating actually new and just uh, societies. I think it's a sign of this failure to recognize the importance of the individual change and the constructive change. So it's only when you combine the three elements, um, which I think I see some, element, some, some signs that, that there are authors and, and activists today that understand the importance of this. Um, I see that as very hopeful that can, can bridge this um, I think unproductive digging down in, in only one of the three aspects that Gandhi suggested. I think it's by time now that we kind of recognize the importance of the combination of the three elements. Right. In this context, <clears throat> uh, how do you respond to the claim that has been made by many activist uh, groups and networks that the violence of the oppressed is justified, particularly when it is very clearly targeted. It does not, uh, it's not terrorism in the sense that it doesn't uh, target innocent random people. Um, and I know that for example, even in a very, very dynamic uh, platform like the World Social Forum, this issue of nonviolence as a fundamental principle on which everybody would agree, I think never got settled if I'm not mistaken. You know, like we all, there's no disagreement on democracy, pretty much. But uh, whether nonviolence should be a fundamental value, a non-negotiable, um, that is not universally agreed. So uh, how do you see that? Well, I... I see it very much, I would say, uh, in the line of Gandhi, or at least in the line that um, I understand Gandhi. And that is that, um, that people that are oppressed uh, don't, do not only have the right, but they also have the duty for their fellow community members to resist um, violence and domination. And if you don't see 
any opportunity to use nonviolence, um, it is better to use violence than, than to be passive in, in face of the oppression of, of um, your people. So I think, yes, there is, there is, a, there is a moral and uh, a legitimacy to the use of, of the armed struggle against oppression. But I see it more like also like Gandhi that it's more efficient to use nonviolent means. It, it's more uh, promising for the possibilities of creating um, a better society afterwards, because it's not only a matter of, of fighting against the um, immediate threat of, of oppression right now. It's also a matter of what actually works in the long term to create any form of liberation. Um, and we see so many cases of uh, the creation of dictatorships where, where armed struggle has been um, uh, successful. And also when we look on the research today, it's very clear that a nonviolent organized resistance is much more efficient in overthrowing even militarized dictatorships. So I think we, 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 uh, we have all kinds of reasons to adopt and expand and, and build knowledge uh, of how to better organize nonviolent means. And I would not criticize um, or uh, condemn uh, oppressed people that use violence to liberate themselves. I would rather try to present uh, alternatives, other ways of going and other ways of doing it. And I would point towards the possibilities of, of doing it um, in a more promising uh, way of liberation. Um, so um, I, I, I think it's important to understand that um, sometimes people don't really see the option of nonviolence. And I don't want nonviolence to be the option of those that are privileged only, those that have the possibility to afford to, to use nonviolence. It needs to be the tool of liberation for those that are most oppressed. Uh, you've also been very closely involved with the European plowshare movement, uh, which yes. is as I've understood, is a nonviolent direct action movement for disarmament. And I think you organize protests at military bases and arms factories. Uh, so since this movement, and I mean, there are other such movements in different parts of the world, why then is the military industrial complex still so powerful? I mean, do you feel disheartened by that? How do you keep up you know, your morale? Or has have these movements made a dent, but it's not so visible in the public? Um, I would say it's always uh, meaningful and important to try. Uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's very often hard to see um, how do we achieve long-term results that actually makes a difference. Um, I would say that um, with our uh, actions, we were in, instrumental in, in creating a, a broader resistance to weapon trade from Europe. Um, but uh, I can't say that we had like an effect in, in lowering the, the, um, the amount of weapon trade. And my own country, Sweden, has increased its weapon trade um even despite our actions um and i just um, think that what is hard to uh, develop um, is uh, long sustaining uh, movements that are mass-based um and i think again gandhi was a genius in doing that and and we have things to learn when it comes to how to do that and and um I am, I'm more thinking that, um, that uh, when there is a, such a movement, they also need a strategy that is a creative, that is building on, on the possibilities of actually um, undermining violent systems. Um, and that's where, uh, hopefully, perhaps, um, the knowledge I'm, I'm part of, building up together with others, can play a role, um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm not 
I'm not one that is driven by uh, only the results of my own actions or what we're doing. I'm, I'm very much driven by the dignity and, and, and the moral duty of, of contributing the best I can um, to provide the tools uh, for liberation struggles. Um, sometimes we live in dark periods when it's very hard to see where things are leading. But I want to uh, say one very optimistic thing, and that is that in, in 2019, just before the, um, uh, the pandemic, we had the, uh, the largest uprising uh, in, in the world history. Um, it was in more than 30 countries around in the world, uh, um, from Chile to Iraq and, and in a number of other countries. Um, we have never seen that, not even during 1968, uh, that level of um, mobilization in different countries. Um, uh, so I, I, I think there are potentials for people to uh, adopt these kind of means. Uh, what I see as a problem is then that these movements are very protest oriented. They, they turn they turn towards the state and they adopt kind of sometimes the yin sharp approach, um, but they don't have like a full range of a strategy uh, <clears throat> building on, on the, the full knowledge uh, this, of nonviolent resistance. Sorry, this mobilization yeah. in 2019, it was against militarization. No, it was it was against ma many different things. Um, and so in a way, it's it's more like a sign of um, how people engage in uh, in uh, struggles for their liberation. So, um, like in many countries, it was against corruption. Um, in in other countries, it was against the authoritarian regime. Um, in, in other, uh, again, it, it, was, it was against the impunity of, of some of the, um, the leaders and so on. So it's, um, it was different issues, but um, it says something about the level of mobilization and yeah. in unarmed struggles in general in the world. Yeah. And at the same time today, uh, say approximately three years later, uh, we are seeing the rise of many right-wing hyper-nationalist regimes in different corners of the world, uh, yeah. all of whom support increased militarization. And underlying this politics is basically uh, the very deliberate cultivation of hatred towards some other, uh, or at any rate, there's a tapping of you know unresolved issues and anxieties based on identity um so how do you see this current trend in the context of the hopefulness and optimism that you spoke about which we saw in 2019 yeah so um there, there are many aspects to this um one one is that it's it's part of the same uh, frustration and fear and insecurity when it comes to uh, the present world order and and the, the regimes that we live with and uh, that's one aspect of it uh, another aspect is that we unfortunately have regimes today that are also very clever in in using um, mass mobilization on the street uh, together with their authoritarian um, um, politics um, and that's very worrying and it's 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 part of um, you could say is part of uh, the understanding of the, the power of the mobilization of people um, in, in, in the street. Um, otherwise, I think it's also, um, unfortunately, um, an example of the, um, um, the, the, uh, the mobilization where people are, because of the climate change, because of a number of, of resource struggles, uh, connected to um, fossil energy and connected to um, the the um, the difficulties with the environmental destruction um, is 
politicians that capitalizes on, on, on the fear and insecurity that, that people feel. And then instead of us um, pointing the finger to the elites that are benefiting on, on the present system, they, they, these authoritarian leaders see the possibility of mobilizing and pointing the fingers to migrants and others, Muslims, um, or people that are in some way regarded to be outsiders. So it's, it's a way to distract um, from, from uh, the real kind of conflicts we live with. Um, and unfortunately, the social media and all that plays a role here in, 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 um, in mobilizing people. So it's, it's a very increased difficulty and, 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 a, and an important challenge uh, that we face. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, finding it troublesome that um, many people that mobilize progressive movements um, are not paying so much interest into uh, actually developing uh, our means of struggle and our strategies. Um, I think we have a very complicated uh, situation today with very active uh, fascist and fundamentalist uh, mobilizations. We have uh, politicians that are um, unshamedly um, ignoring human rights and, and democratic principles. Um, at the same time as we have the urgency of dealing with climate uh, and the crisis it, it involves. Um, so we, we need to find ways of collaborating transnationally because this is not a national issue, this is a global issue. And we need to find more um, sustainable, uh, promising long-term solutions when we do sometimes succeed with overthrowing authoritarian regimes. Um, but to do that, we, we actually need to pay interest to the knowledge. Um, we need to uh, stop repeating the same kind of mistakes. Um, and I, I think a mistake that is key here is, is this um, three-part uh, strategy that I, yeah. I talked about with Gandhi. Yeah. Um, it's not enough to, um, to have a mobilization that is only trying to overthrow. It's not going to be enough. Um, we need to have an idea of what kind of a different society do we want to create. And um, how, how do we make sure that the state doesn't become that uh, militarized monster that is uh, centralized and, and capable to repress people? Um, Gandhi was skeptical to, uh, to taking any kind of position within even a liberated new India um, in the state. Um, his emphasis was on the villages and the village republic that could be created through the autonomy of, of communities. Um, and that's also why I'm, I'm, I'm paying more interest in looking at uh, uh, radical groups like the Kurds and the Zapatistas, in, in, in the indigenous Zapatistas in southern Mexico, that are trying to create uh, more of uh, autonomy instead of, of always being focused on, on, um, on the state. Right. You've also been very closely involved in the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. Yes. Uh, what are some of the insights you could share from that experience? Because uh, I remember that it's a very powerful mobilization. Um, so in what ways did it enrich both the participants and the cause? Given that, in a sense, the the, the whole idea was quite, uh, yeah. No, no. Just that because the larger situation remains complex and seemingly, uh, you know, unsolvable. So, what are the yeah. energizing and what are the reaffirmations that the flotilla was able to, uh, you know, bring to the situation? Because that's very important to keep up the energies for the yes, long haul. Yes, it is. So. I would say that the, the idea was very simple um, in the same way as when uh, Gandhi had his genius idea of that, um, let's um, create salt ourselves. Um, when the British is banning um, Indians from um, making salt, 
um, because you can't really stop that. And the same with um, the Gaza Freedom Fortilla was that uh, it was recognized and is recognized by uh, United Nations, the Red Cross, Amnesty, everyone, that it, it, it is a humanitarian crisis uh, for the people that live in Gaza. So the, the blockade is having humanitarian catastrophic uh, effects. So the idea was we, we, we sail to, to Gaza uh, with humanitarian aid. And when we do that, when it's necessary for humanitarian reasons, uh, we at the same time are breaking uh, the illegal blockade of, of, um, of Israel um, on, on uh, Gaza. So, uh, and this is, I think it's the important lesson from, from uh, the, the, the Freedom Fotilla is that if we are doing our homework, we can develop creative strategies that actually can um, uh, make a difference. And in this case, it was like, we decided that um, if we um, have a, uh, a, a large enough freedom for Tila, it's so large that it cannot be ignored. You know, there have been some smaller boats that went through with humanitarian aid before and Israel was just letting them through. But if we had hundreds of people and, and several boats uh, going, it would be so big that Israel would be presented in, with a dilemma. The dilemma would be like, either they let it through, uh, and if they do, then uh, the blockade would be broken more people could do the same and it would create the precedent, right? The other option for them would be to stop it. But uh, since the boats would never go on Israeli waters, but only on international waters and then on the Palestinian waters, they would not have, have jurisdiction. So they would have to break the international law in order to stop the boats. And, and since we refuse to let them come on board, um, they would have to do it with military force. So actually the Israeli government had uh, um, uh, night meetings um, discussing this dilemma and, and they came out from that presenting to the press saying that uh, whatever we will do, we will be the, the bad guys. Um, so they were very frustrated uh, with the situation. And um, when we did it in 2010, they. Um, they opted for um, uh, using the military solution. And they killed um, 10 of our activists and, and wounded uh, 35 people. So that created a, an unprecedented condemnation of Israel. Even United States um, did not put in a veto in the Security Council. So there was an, a unique um, uh, st uh, statement against Israel after this. So Israel had really trouble uh, because of this. So I think we, we created a strategy that made it difficult for them to um, continue to uphold the blockade. Uh, the problem though, uh, and what we also can learn from this is that Israel later developed um, a very sophisticated strategy to counter uh, this freedom for Tula. Um, so, in the same way as we need to be creative when we develop strategies, uh, we have to take into account that some opponents will be very creative in, in devising new strategies of how to undermine resistance. So I think we, we with the Freedom Fatilla, gave some hope to the Palestinians in Gaza. There was some uh, um, um, changes of, of the blockade, uh, but the blockade is still there. Uh, so we didn't have any fundamental impact, but I think we show that international activists and solidarity can uh, make a difference. Um, I would just hope that we could continue to be in a similar way, creative in developing and designing um, uh, activist, ac activities like this. Um, so here I take in, again inspiration from Gandhi. I think the salt march was was a genius move um, because you you can't stop ordinary people from going out to the ocean in India. Um, yeah. There is not so enough soldiers in the world to stop that. Yeah. 
But that scale of mobilization of people, that scale of mass mobilization is also very rare because uh, the importance of the salt satyagraha is that across the coastline of India, people spontaneously went to beaches and symbolically yeah. picked up or, you know, made salt. Uh, so is that one of the challenges for the nonviolence movement in the 21st century? I mean, plural movements. Is it that it is only in rare situations that that large scale numbers are um, brought together? Because the irony is that perhaps uh, more people are in favor of uh, at least not violence. Uh, because oh, non-violence oh. is not the absence of violence. But no. I, I, my, my sense is that far more people today, for example, if you see the kind of broad-based opposition abroad, I mean, across the world to the whole Ukraine crisis and the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I mean, mm. people in far-flung countries who are completely unaffected for themselves um, you know, are writing, are speaking uh, about the outrage of that. And uh, yet, uh, these kinds of conflicts are persisting because there is Yemen, there is, of course, the whole uh, Afghan situation. So on the, uh, how do you see this paradox? On the one hand, we do have more awareness against violence. And yet, large scale nonviolent mobilization doesn't seem to be reaching the kind of scale where, you know, it could change history. Well, uh, you know, um, one part of this uh, is um, the question if, if um, it's rare or not with uh, large scale mobilization. Uh, and that's why I mentioned the example of 2019 uh, with the largest mobilization in, in the world history. Um, so um, I think it exists much more now than ever before, uh, but you are right that uh, we have a couple of problems and, and one of them is the sustainability of these mass mobilizations. The other one is um, its, its ability to actually have an impact that make a difference. Um, and I think that all speaks to the importance of organization and strategy. Um, so in my view, it's not that people are not ready to get mobilized. Uh, I think it's more a matter of the organizers and the strategists that are actually lagging behind. They're lagging behind um, what the repressive regimes and the authoritarian mobilizations are able to do. Their, their creativity, their, their repertoire of, of different methods. And um, it's also, um, not really building on on, uh, on on the research that exists uh, available uh, of uh, what we could learn from previous struggles. So I, I think people will not be ready to um, mobilize for a long whole struggle uh, if they don't see that it leads anywhere. Mm. Um, so I think it's a duty we have to kind of think through uh, our strategies and the way we organize because um, we also need inspiring examples of things that are possible to achieve. Um, and that's why I find it important to lift up um, examples like the landless workers in Brazil that have achieved something that is uh, very unique and the Zapatistas and the Kurds, um, despite extremely difficult circumstances, they have achieved something. Um, it, they have not achieved a, a utopia, they haven't created a full solution, any one of them, but they have achieved something that is uh, important. And, and I think that needs to be lifted up, but it's also important that uh, in, 
in, in future struggles, we, we are more creative and more knowledgeable when we are applying the strategies uh, of how we do things. So uh, I would say people are ready to act when it comes to uh, protecting Ukraine and, and stopping the war. But what do we do? What can we do? Um, and that's here where um, I think we need to be uh, really uh, putting our heads together and developing ideas. Um, so uh, it goes to so many other issues like the climate crisis and so on. Um, and, and one more thing is that um, the kind of power that the Hindu nationalists are having in India today, it's not something that happened uh, in the last election. It's, it's something that happened through the, the uh, grassroots mobilization of uh, very efficient local grassroots organizing by the RSS um, like 100 years ago. Um, that, that's where uh, all that began, right? So uh, I think we need to have a long-term uh, idea of how we build uh, a different kind of, of movement. Uh, we cannot have just mass mobilizations in, in, the, in the city squares of the capital in Delhi or in, in, in London or in, in Washington. That's not going to change the violent systems we live in. It's much more complex than that. But at the same time, we need to show results. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I hope I make sense that. Um, yeah, no, no, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. To, to just give it. To just give an example, if, if you allow me, very briefly. Please, please. So the landless workers in Brazil, uh, they create immediate effects for the poor uh, people that lives in the slums by occupying land and creating uh, cooperatives and food production, right? So it's, it's an immediate solution for, for families that starve and, and don't have any resources. But then they link these land occupations into a movement that is challenging the whole Brazilian um, land distribution and, and, and the politics of what kind of Brazil um, the country is trying to develop. And I think that's a key one, you know, it's, it's, it's very immediate, it's very clear results, it creates hope for, for the people that are poor, but it links to a revolutionary struggle that is long-term. Um, and, you know, a lot of when we go around and we wave our banners, it doesn't speak to the poor, it doesn't speak to the oppressed people, because where are the results? Yeah. So, sort of in closing, um, what would you say to young people today who want to work for the, or with the nonviolent approach for justice and dignity, uh, but sometimes they feel daunted because the, uh, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that we live in a far more complex uh, political economy, a far more complex cultural, psychological situation than maybe our species has ever seen before. So mm. I, I meet a lot of young people who, and they define nonviolence very diversely, but they are broadly drawn to the idea of nonviolence as justice, nonviolence as dignity for all, and nonviolence as uh, uh, a process of dialogue uh, through which we can solve uh, large problems. But at the same time, they feel daunted and they, you know, feel as though um, it's too uphill a battle. And, and, and so what, what advice would you give to say young people? What are some of the inner resources that they can cultivate, you know, to, to, to stay on this journey and, and to, uh, and it's not about success or failure. It's about, uh, you know, uh, Staying with the journey with all your conviction and faith and passion. What have you learned that you could share with them? Well, um, I would say a couple of things. Um, 
And these, these are the kind of things I tell also my, my students. Um, and that is that, uh, um, firstly, you need to be clear that this is a, this is a way of life. This is, um, is going to be for the rest of your life. So you need to find ways that are sustainable for you as an individual. That means that you also need to um, adopt in your own life um, this, uh, this um, approach of, of the three elements. So you need to work on yourself. Um, and that can take many different forms. Um, uh, but that is an aspect of it. You need to work with the constructive elements in, in your own everyday life. Um, and you need to link up then to people that are doing resistance. Um, and I would say then that my advice would be to do two things. Uh, read, uh, because there's so much to learn. Um, and uh, it's important to have uh, a broader understanding uh, of struggles in other parts of the world and in, in the history and, and so on. The other thing is to tag on to uh, some experienced activists that are um, doing it in a way that is inspiring for you. So when you do that, you will learn and get inspiration and you will see how they're doing stuff. Um, and you will then be able to um, build on their experience instead of uh, um, jumping to um, something and create it by yourself without connection to uh, the experience that other people have done. So I think that would be kind of my main uh, recommendation, but I would also add one more thing when it comes to people like me, people that are born into privilege. So uh, when you're born into privilege, you need to be aware that there is a very strong force from the, the kind of system we live in today to co-opt you. And that happens uh, in, in many different ways. So therefore, you have to be very careful uh, with what kind of job you, you select, uh, where, what neighborhood you live, and what people you socialize with. Because you can be super radical as a, as a young person, but if you get a job that sucks you into the system and you live in a neighborhood together with people that are not engaged like you and are not among the poor and oppressed. And if you socialize with people that are privileged like you, you will, with time, you will become, in the worst case, you will become a conservative and, and um, a reaction a comfortable radical that is not challenging the system, but it's just, um, you know, uh, writing something and, and acting out of things that don't threaten your own privilege. So it's very important for privileged people to create an environment for yourself that can sustain uh, the possibility of being engaged for the rest of your life. And, and the, I think there is a reason why Gandhi ad advocated that you need to live among those people that you fight for. So my, just to give an example, I, I was living for 15 years in an immigrant neighborhood in Sweden, uh, exactly with, with this motivation, um, that I wanted to live among those people that have fled from war and poverty uh, and to work together with them. Thank you so much. Thank you for making the time Thank and you. being part of the series. My honor. Thank you for inviting me.